my blessings, everyone. Come on in. Come on in. Are you ready to worship the Most High God? I know you are. I know you have been from the moment that you arose today. And you realize that the Lord had granted you another day for His power and for His presence. With every breath that we take, folks, we worship the Most High God. Is that not exciting? And so you've been worshiping in fellowship. I saw you ladies back here. Y'all just been having a party. You're worshiping in fellowship and in friendship. Now we get to do that wonderful thing of worshiping corporately as his body and declaring the things, declaring the things of the kingdom. Let's do so.
Awesome job. Everyone can have a seat. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for coming out this morning. I know y'all are dying to go to the Mom Fest, so thank y'all for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, welcome if this is your first time visiting with us. Uh, we would love to meet you out at the welcome tent. We have a gift uh, that we would love to give you and to be able to answer some questions that you might have uh, about Union Point Church. Our mission is simple. We're a family of local churches on mission to lift Jesus and others in eastern North Carolina. Um, and we're going to do things a little bit different here uh, for this announcement. I'm going to go over some announcements really quick. I got a huge list. I'm going to hit some important stuff, leave out some other stuff. Exchange, that's our youth ministry. High school meets tonight, uh, 630 to 8. Middle school, Wednesday, 630 to 8. And then we're moving on. Lift and treat. We have a packing party coming up for that uh, Wednesday at 630. Uh, if you have time available to come out, uh, help us pack up candy, all that other good stuff. We're also asking for donations for canned Pepsis, just canned Pepsis. That's it. Just plain old original canned Pepsi. Uh, we would love for you guys to donate that because we give one out to every person that night as well. Ascent uh, is Wednesday, uh, October 25th at 630. Uh, it's a time of worship. Uh, we have dedications and baptisms coming up. Um, that is on November 5th. Uh, if you have a child who's never been dedicated, uh, we would love to, to uh, partner with you as believers, as brothers and sisters, in uh, dedicating that child to the Lord. Also, if you are a believer, um, you put your faith in Jesus, and uh, maybe you've never been baptized. Uh, we are commanded to be baptized. It's one of the things that Jesus commanded us to do. It's that declaration of war. You know, the old man is dead, the new is born, and uh, you're, on, you're on the side of the true kingdom now. So we invite you, uh, if you're interested in that, you can sign up uh, in the apps. Uh, Tables Project is coming up. This is our ministry where we feed those who are hungry during the Christmas holiday. Uh, we are shooting for 200 boxes. We are not asking for food donation. We are asking for monetary donations for that. It's about $50 a box. Um, we're very blessed where we live at. I work in the school system. Trust me, there are plenty of people in our community that need help, uh, that don't have food. Uh, so if you are able to donate to that, please do so. You can do so in the app. There's a drop down uh, and it says tables. Uh, men's retreat, five spots left. Heads up, guys. Five spots left. If you're on the fence, do it. If you're worried about money, who cares? Still do it. Come talk to us. We'll take care of it, okay? Five spots left. Don't let that hold you back. November 9th through 12th. I'm out of breath, but what I want to do is um, we got Carrie Willis with us here, him and his wife, and can I ask y'all to come up here real quick? Sorry, I didn't tell you I was doing this. Oh, no, up here. Oh, of course. Just don't trip behind Chris. That's all we ask. Um, if you notice, we have a lot of people missing today. Um, just keep Mandy Van Dommel in your prayers. Her mom has recently passed away. Uh, we have a lot of people going down visiting with her right now. Um, but I felt like it, that what a great time it would be to anoint you guys and pray over you. Um, if, you if you have not been here the last couple nights, Carrie Willis has been doing our frequency conference as we try to dial back in to the right things. Um, and he's done this the last couple years that I've been here, and it's been a blessing to me. Um, every night, you know, you're tired from work. You're stressed out, you come in, and I feel like I leave blown away. And I, you know, it's, it's God using a man speaking through you. So uh, thank you for allowing that to happen. Thank you for being the support and the loving person behind that. Uh, so if I can, uh, my peeps up here, Dell's gonna keep on playing. Uh, we're just gonna anoint you guys, we're gonna lay hands on y'all, and we would love to pray for you guys as, as you move along, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, um, first of all, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the fact that you see uh, individuals like us, you desire us, and you desire to use us. So thank you for this couple standing before me, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness to them and their faithfulness to you, God. Thank you for the words that you have given Carrie to speak to us, Lord. Um, we just ask that you do so again for this final service, God. But I just ask that you bless them, that you do not hide your face from them, Lord, that when they seek you out, you will be ever present and ever clear to them, Lord, wherever they go. 
And in those times of heartache, during those times of struggle, Lord, reveal yourself hand in hand with them right where they're at, God. You have done many works through them, Lord, and there's many more to come. Be with them. Strengthen them. Help them finish strong, Lord. Help their focus be only on you. And we thank you and we praise you. Amen.
You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Thank you, Brother Dale. <laughs> Ten talent guy there. Wow. Glad that the Lord gets to have all that talent for his glory. Dale and Meemaw. I think they got double duty this weekend. Or maybe it's quadruple duty. Thank you all for showing up. <laughs> It would just be a sound check without you. Speaking of sound check, 
I know some things about your worship band that you don't know. Do you want me to tell you? I knew you were curious. Uh, they really are dedicated. My RV's parked right there. And before my alarm went off this morning, I was awakened by the bass drum and the bass guitar. <laughs> they were getting ready for y'all. And they wanted to bring the best, most excellent worship they could for the Lord. And um, I said in the first service, one thing I know about Union Point, when it comes to worship leading, you have no B team. Everyone's A team. And that's a great gift uh, to the Lord, but uh, to the local church. So we're grateful. I told Chris last night that... Uh, I'd like to take him on the road with me. I think they'd come to hear me preach just to hear him sing. He's so humble. He hates that I'm saying that, but what's he going to do about it? I'm leaving in just a few minutes. <laughs> well, if you've been with us this week, you probably know where we're at. If you haven't, it won't take long. I'm the horsey ducky preacher. Okay, do you know what that is? Well, it's Peanuts cartoon. You ever heard of that? My favorite theologian, Lucy. <laughs> and it's Lucy and Linus and Charlie Brown, and they're laying flat on their back on the green grass on a summer day, and the cloud formations are just wild. And so Lucy looks at Linus and says, What do you see, Linus, in the clouds? He said, Oh, Lucy, I see the martyr Stephen. He's standing outside of Jerusalem, and they're stoning him. And right over here, I see the Apostle Paul, then Saul. He's holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Wow. Charlie Brown, what do you see? <laughs> well, I was going to say I see a horsey and a ducky. But I think I changed my mind. <laughs> I'm the horsey ducky preacher. My spiritual gift is not to miss the obvious. So if you haven't been here all week, it won't take you long to saddle up. Um, I'm all for complicated. I just am not that. <clears throat> if you have your copy of Scripture, or if you don't, I'm going to read one verse to begin with that I hadn't been able to get off my heart. We've been talking about frequency, and that's the idea of, you know, making a connection, fine-tuning, you know, everything. Jerry Clower, some of you ever heard of old Jerry Clower? He's an old country comedian. He's with the Lord now. But he said when he was a boy, uh, they used to sit around an old radio in the home of the neighborhood, in the neighborhood, they had the strongest frequency, the strongest signal, and they listened to the Grand Ole Opry, you know. He said, once we got it dialed in, just where we wanted it, we ripped the knobs off that sucker. <laughs> um, now, if that don't make any sense to you, you're very young, and you should give thanks for that. I mean, you knew it was an old story, Grand Ole Opry, old, but... That's what we're talking about this week is frequency. It's uh, fine-tuning our connection with God. And the key word is presence. Actually, um, out in the RV, I have a few shirts that I wear. Uh, I'm the district servant. They call it superintendent, but that's too fancy for me. So I call it the district servant. I oversee about 60 churches and. Uh, Philadelphia region from um, um, Kings, uh, not Kingsport, from Williamsport, uh, Pennsylvania to Cape May, New Jersey. And um, so I have a little shirt made. I, I didn't have any gear, you know. Y'all are big on gear around here. You know, you got a lot of Union Point gear, you know, clothes and cups and I don't know, maybe toilet plungers. I, you got all kinds of things with the logo. And I like the logo. I actually have one of your coffee cups in Cape May. But um, we decided we need a few shirts, you know, so people will know we were serious. 
So we got our shirt, and it says Philadelphia District Church of the Nazarene. has a little logo there. And underneath it, it has my three favorite words. Presence matters most. That's the frequency. It's the presence of God with and within us. Now, in the Old Testament, God is beginning what he's after ultimately. And most always in the Old Testament, when it comes to the presence of God, it's God with his people. And that's wonderful, but it gets more gooder um, in the New Testament. When Pentecost happened, um, that was the day when the Holy Spirit came down to Jerusalem and moved within the believers. And that's what God was after in the Old Testament. Whenever you see that he is with his people, that's the beginning ingredients of what he really is after. And what it means is that he longs to be in intimate relationship with us, as intimate as can be. Uh, the verse in John 17 that I, this morning, it just was on my heart because it kind of it goes with the explanation of this Wonderful inheritance of ours. In John 17, this is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. I mean, he's literally on his way to Gethsemane, and he's with his disciples, and he prayed this prayer before he would be arrested and, and go to the cross. And in verse 3, he's praying to the Father. He says, Now, this is eternal life. Now, the key word being now. Do you know that many believers believe that eternal life is only later? Well, not according to what Jesus is praying and saying in the high priestly prayer. He says, now this is eternal life that they may know you, know God the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So what Jesus is saying to us is that once we know God, and it's a little bit of a riddle because Jesus has already said in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So we can't know the Father unless we know the Son. That's the riddle. But what he is saying is that if we know the Father through the Son, eternal life is already ours. That's important. If we could get that in our mind and, and receive our inheritance. So... Uh, my mentor, James, he lives outside of Nashville. He's 84, still preaching every Sunday, still doing revivals. I want to be like him when I grow up. He's sharp as a tack. And I told him, I said, James, if you go before me, I'd like to have a brain transplant. I'd like to have your brain put in me. He is that sharp. He called me a while back, and, and he said, uh, Carrie, you know, I, at my age, I'm thinking a lot more about dying I said, well, I understand that, James, because I'm the oldest I've ever been. And I spend more time thinking about dying as well. He said, but the Lord kind of rebuked me. I said, oh, he did? Yeah, he said, that old dying thing is like stinking thinking, I believe, to God. He, don't, he doesn't like me dwelling on that. And he said, the other day I was in John chapter 11, and I was kind of pounding this whole dying idea. And uh, he said, God asked me, he said, uh, James, do you actually believe you're going to die? Why would you believe a lie like that? <laughs> and he said, read what I said to Martha. 
And in John 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And, you know, he goes on to say, whoever believes this will never die. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. And he said, I began to saturate in that idea and asking the Holy Spirit, you know, to explain this to me. What is it I'm missing? <laughs> and he said, the simplest way I can say it to you, Carrie, is this what I sense the Lord saying. James, shut up about dying. You're not going to die. You're simply going to leave. <laughs> he said, now, Carrie, I don't know about you, but I'm more excited about leaving than dying. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he says, now, this is eternal life. Not later. Now, this is eternal life that they may know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Do you know God now? The other piece of that is if we don't know God now, eternal life will escape our grasp. We know this, but we don't think much about it. Um, I had a favorite candy in high school. Um, it would pull the feelings right out of your teeth, uh, but I, I kept eating it. I had a good dentist. And... Uh, and that candy describes what is being said here. I didn't know if they still made it because at my age I need my fillings <clears throat> and I've, I've quit eating it. But I figured they didn't even make it anymore. I was on the interstate the other day and this big semi passed me. One of the prettiest semis I've ever seen and it was painted with this candy logo. So they're still doing well. Maybe you've heard of it now and later. I got blessed when the truck passed me, not because of my memory of that candy and how good it is, but that eternal life is not later, it's now and later. It's both and. But the only way we can have eternal life is to know God. Now, there's a difference. I fear many church people know about God but they don't know God. I mean, not this church. I'm talking about other churches, you know. Um, you know, I, um, when they had the 100-year anniversary of the Wright brothers flying the glider over Kitty Hawk, uh, we took our family a few years back, and um, thousands of people came to Kitty Hawk, and we were there. And one amazing thing about that day was 100 years later, they, they couldn't fly the glider that Wilbur, Wilbur flew 100 years earlier. That was pretty amazing. They kept crashing. I couldn't do anything but laugh. Uh, they never did get it off the ground. Uh, but they had a plan B for everybody there that no one knew about. Uh, these four U.S. Marine Corps helicopters circled the site. And in a minute, we saw a motorcade, and George W. Bush came. Nobody knew he was coming. And uh, I don't care what political flavor you are, maybe most of you are no political flavor now, but when, when the commander-in-chief comes with those four Marine Corps helicopters, it's a pretty moving event, <laughs> I'm telling you. Everybody's wondering, which one's he in? Um, but George W. Bush came to the platform and, and gave a beautiful speech, and I was back in the crowd. Now... Uh, if I were to see George W. Bush today, maybe he's painting a picture of a hound dog or something. That's what he does now, paints. Um, and I walked up to him and said, uh, hey, President Bush, I know you. He'd say, huh? He, well, you know, I was there that day with Wilbur and Orville <laughs> memory. And uh, he'd say, well, I don't know you. See, I know about him. But I, I don't know him in intimacy. Uh, he wouldn't say, hey, Carrie, how's it going? We don't want to have that kind of relationship with God. Uh, the scripture, it keeps me kind of awake at night. I mean, nothing really keeps me awake. But I sleep sound. My wife says that I fall asleep before I actually put my head on the pillow. Uh, it's a little tiny bit of an exaggeration. Uh, but I, I sleep well. But if I'm having trouble sleeping, if there's a scripture that keeps me awake... Jesus was uh, sharing the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And at the end, in chapter 7, he's bringing that message to a screeching halt. 
And uh, he says something like this. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is really godly. And then he goes on to say, uh, in that day, that final day, uh, many will say, um, Lord, we uh, did miracles in your name. And uh, we prophesied in your name. Now, in that context, prophesy equals preach, preaching. We preached in your name. Do you know that I have preached in his name for quite a few years now? And then he goes on to say, I never knew you. And in the New Living Translation, the 1996 edition, the way he ended that paragraph, I never knew you away from me, depart from me. The things you did were unauthorized. Now you see why it would keep me awake. That I would spend my whole life uh, preaching in the name of Jesus and at the end, he would say, I never knew you. And all that stuff you did was just a waste. I mean, maybe some others came to know me through what you shared, but, you know, the things you did were unauthorized. What he's accenting is that he doesn't want to be the God we know about. He wants to be the God who knows us intimately and we know him intimately. Actually, that's what he's after. That's in the Old Testament, he started this idea of being present with his people. But that was not the end game. But God is a patient God because God is love and love is patient, you see. So he started way back there in Genesis. I mean, even in the Garden of Eden, in the cool of the day, he walked with Adam and Eve. He was with them. But he wanted so much more. That was just like, the engagement, you know. He wanted to know us. And the only way that he knew that would be possible would be if he could place his presence within our lives. Not just be with us, but move inside us. And that's why I say with great confidence, and I think sometimes I tick off church people, but I, I can't help it. I don't do it intentionally. Mainly, Jesus is not looking for followers anymore. Because that's with him. We're separated. He's in front, we're behind. That's good. I have nothing against following, but the inheritance is more gooder. It's not ultimately what he's after. Especially since Pentecost happened. He's not mainly looking for followers. He's looking for sanctuaries. Tabernacles. Temples. Do you know the definition of all three of those? The dwelling place of God. He wants to take up residency, even presidency, within our lives. You know... Jesus has a real God complex. <laughs> he wants to be God. So know, know, know me. Um, really, it's like a couple uh, who has dated, courted, whatever, and on the night of the wedding, this is the way God planned it, on the night of the wedding, you really get to know each other, you see. It's more than having a float at the drugstore, and it's more than a pizza at the Pizza Hut. It's more than a latte at the Mum Fest. That's all dating. That's all courting. That's with one another. But reserved for marriage is the intimacy of oneness where we go from with to within. Um, 
It's amazing. In fact, I think that's one reason God gave us marriage, to help us understand what he means by know me. It's different. In the Old Testament, I'm going to back up just a little bit here and um, give you something from the Old Testament. Um, In Exodus 13, now this is the Moses era, and... uh, and, and let me just read it to you. I'll story tell it to you. I like to story tell the scriptures. Have you picked that up? Rather than just get, you go turning your pages the whole time. I'm for turning pages, but you go check it all out later, see if I said it was right. But I, I like to look at you when I talk. And I like for you to look at me, you know. So it, it's, a, it's a communication. Not against it, but it's just kind of not my style of ducky, horsey, you know. Um, as Exodus 13, I want to read this, though. The Lord went ahead of them. Now, these are his people. They're, they're slaves in Egypt, and they're about to be delivered from the Pharaoh. And it says, the Lord went ahead of them. He's with them. He's ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day and by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from his place in front of the people. So if you were to talk to Moses and say, what's the real secret about you leading all these thousands of Jews out of Egypt? He would say, don't look at me. (laughs) I tried to get out of this. Remember, I told God I stutter. And he said, no big deal. I'll give you Aaron. He'll talk for you. But what Moses would say, that would have never happened. We never would have escaped Egypt unless the presence of God was with us. This was the frequency we were on. (laughs) He was calling the shots. It's a beautiful thing. You know, even in that scripture, the love of God is all through it. But we don't understand it because we don't live in a Middle Eastern desert. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever been in the Middle Eastern desert. I've been there many times. In the Middle Eastern desert, it is extremely hot in the daytime and extremely cold at night. It's the weirdest thing. It can be any season. But it's extremely hot in the daytime and extremely cold at night. And what did God give them? In the day, he gave them a pillar of cloud. You know what we would call that? Shade. You see, my wife's crazy about the beach. I'm crazy about the beach at sunrise and sunset. And if fireworks are short, shooting over it at night. In the middle of the day, you can have the beach. You see? Because there's no pillar of cloud. But I love my wife, so I want to be with her. And, you know, <laughs> we're one and all of that. And um, I don't want someone else at the beach trying to pick up my main squeeze, you know, so I, I need to be there. So I have learned out of love to enjoy the beach even during the day. I have a great umbrella. I think it's 14 years old now. I bought it in Ocracoke, North Carolina. I cannot find another one like it. I want a spare, but I don't think it's going to break. I think it's going to outlast me. And uh, I am the best planter of an umbrella on the east coast how do i know it because when everyone else is flying out and shooting like spears across the beach mine is still there and afterwards people come to me why is your umbrella still here and i get out my shovel and all the stuff i use and go put theirs in the ground now there's two that don't go anywhere what i'm saying is i have to have shade by day in order to to show love to my wife and to be present God gave a cloud during the hot days in the desert to his people because he loved them. And his presence, where he's present, his love is present. At night, you know where I'm going. I wish you didn't. But it's very, very cold. And he gave them a furnace. (laughs) Fire. I mean, he heated the place up wherever they went. And when he moved, they moved with him, you know. It was just, they had this oneness. It wasn't all that God wanted it to be yet, but he was starting to court us, starting to tell us what he wanted. Yeah, I know, it's pretty good. I can't get over it either. And then in Exodus 33, now they've been 
you know, out there for a while. Um, uh, listen to this conversation. Um, I guess it's time to move again, <laughs> and, and God is going to engage Moses. And in Exodus 33, 14, the Lord replied to Moses, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before in the New Testament? Come unto me. <laughs> All of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Oh, man, I love when the Old Testament shows up in the New Testament, don't you? That's Jesus' words. That's his invitation to us. He's inviting us to come into his presence. Come unto me. Oh. And God, in the Old Testament, he's, he said, he's saying he's doubling down on his promise. He said, he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. That's a nice way of saying, if you're not going... We're not going. God, these are your people. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I agreed to partner with you, but don't you forget, these are your people. And you know, the whole time Moses is leading God's people uh, through the wilderness, at the back of the group, there's a back to Egypt committee forming the whole time. You know, It's like church. Same, same idea. That group that wants to go backwards. They, they don't want to go forward. They want to go backwards. <laughs> and so I tell pastors when I counsel them, since your pastor's not here, I'll let you in on it. Um, he's at a funeral today, in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> I say to pastors, when it gets really difficult, just go to God in prayer and say, God, your church has a problem. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> He loves that because his presence, we're dependent on it still, just like Moses was. If you're going to lead God's people, you, you better not do it apart from the presence. It's going to be a real mess. Um, and then in verse 15, then Moses said to him, if your presence not, does not go with us, do not send us up from here. And then in verse 16, Moses still talking, How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else would distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Moses on to something. That's not changed. Do you know the only convincer, if we claim to be a Jesus believer... The only convincer that we belong to him, I mean the only convincer, is his presence in our lives. I have never met anyone who came to Christ because they lost an argument with me over theology, over what God wanted for their life. But I have had people who sensed God's presence about me or within me. And later they told me what drew them in. That's not about me, but it's about me being a sanctuary and his presence dwelling in me. And often God will do that kind of thing, not even let you know what he's doing, because then he gets the glory, you see, and then later on they will remind you. Well, what do you mean? What's the story about that? Well, I knew you'd ask, so I have one. Uh, her name is Annie. How do I know? Uh, because um, I love a Chinese buffet. I think that the marriage supper of the lamb, uh, that the Chinese are going to be in charge of the food, the menu. Um, and uh, we had a little Chinese restaurant there in Harrisonburg, Virginia, where we lived. And um, China Jade. And it became my favorite place. Uh, first day I was in there, uh, this precious Chinese girl came to my table. And the first thing out of my mouth was, what's your name? And she started crying. I said, oh, no, I've messed up on culture somewhere. It wasn't that. I said, are you okay? And she blubbered, why do you want to know my name? Well, I said, I plan on coming here a lot. We're going to be friends. 
And she blubbered some more. I said, are you okay? She said, you're the only person who's ever asked my name. I'm Annie. Now, see, that was Jesus' presence reaching through me because I was really there to eat, <laughs> especially the green beans. Oh, my gracious. Make your tongue slap your brains out. I mean, <laughs> good stuff. But the Lord was there for another reason. You see, he's there for Annie, and he's in charge. He's large and in charge in my life, his presence. I can't take credit for it. He said, well, you're such a nice guy. You asked her name. Well, I don't think I had a whole lot to do with it, but I am surrendered to the presence. Well, it's a long story, but it's a beautiful story. Annie would go on to own that restaurant. She was just the waitress. I stayed long enough to see her take ownership. She and her, her husband. Then they had two little twin girls. And they called me Uncle Carrie. Because every time I went, the Lord said, don't go to China J without cash. Do not go with just your credit card because the twins might be there and I want to give them some money through you. <laughs> That's the way he works. So I couldn't go in without a $5 bill for each of them or whatever. And I became Uncle Carrie. At Christmas time, we went in, and they had an Atari or something, some big game system. And they were sitting up in the restaurant playing while everybody's eating. And I said, Santa Claus? And they said, no, Uncle Kerry. <laughs> they had saved all their money and bought an Atari system. Amazing. See, I didn't realize what God was up to. But he was reeling Annie in, reeling her family in. Well, I had a sabbatical. That's when a pastor needs a break and the church needs a break from the pastor. So I took eight weeks away from the community. And um, on the day I returned, you know, I, I, I had been holding off my addiction for eight weeks to China Jade. I was, I was sweating and everything when I got back to town. And my, one of my first stops was China Jade. And I went in. And when I walked in, I, I was seated by the host I think his name was Andy, and he sat me back in the corner, and then he looked at me real seriously. He said, you stay here. I said, I plan to. <laughs> What's up? Annie will want to talk with you. He went in the kitchen. They had saloon doors into the kitchen. And she came out of those saloon doors like a bull, like a matador and a bull. I mean, everybody in the restaurant heard her. She came straight back to my corner, tears streaming down her face. Where have you been? I thought you had died. Whole restaurants listening. Don't you ever leave town for more than two weeks. You tell Annie. <laughs> She's in third person now. You tell Annie. She walked away. And the Lord said, you just don't get it, do you? Whenever Annie's restaurant was having a bad week, I ate there about three, four times a week. <laughs> I'd ask her on the last time that week, how's business, Annie? Not good. I would end my service on Sunday morning. I'd say, friends, <laughs> we had 1,200 in our church. My friend Annie's going to need a little help. And by the time I got to the China Jade, there was a waiting line of nothing but people from our church and uh, Annie and her husband and kids had to move back to China. It broke our hearts. She came to the table one night, Kim and I were in there and started weeping and told us that their parents were sick and they had to go home. And they didn't have money for the airfare. And our church took a love offering and flew them all home. 
You know, I never won Annie to Christ myself. I never had that opportunity to pray the sinner's prayer with her. One day she was trying to learn English, and I did take a chance. So I said, I think I can help you. And so I got a Bible with English on one page and Mandarin on the other. And I planted that seed in her life. I wonder what's happened in China by now. That's been at least 10 years, maybe more. But the presence of God in Annie's life was undeniable when we came. It was something she had never experienced. So I have to leave it in the Lord's hands, you know. I believe I'll see Annie in heaven because the Lord touched her a whole lot through the likes of me and many others who came to love Annie because Jesus loved her. That's just an example of what I'm saying. That that's the strongest thing we got going is the presence of God in our lives. Well, there's a whole lot more, but uh, it's Sunday and I don't want to be the last one to leave. Had to cut the lights out, uh, you know, when I leave. If you would go back with me to John 17, I'll give you the conclusion. Um, we're getting ready to have communion, uh, take the elements. I think you do that every Sunday. Maybe for some of you, this has become a ritual. Uh, because if you do something, you know, every week, it can just become, okay, this is what we do at Union Point. I don't think that's why you do it. I'm saying there may be a few that even when I say that, you kind of exhale and go to the table again. Uh, because life can, can do that to us. But I think after I share, uh, I don't think the table will ever be the same for you. I was um, leading communion, often did that. And uh, we set up the communion, you know, so that people know why they're coming and, and what the Lord has instituted. And I was praying years ago, and I said, Lord, I'm going to be, you know, opening the table of communion today. Would you please share something with me that I haven't seen that you really are after? What it is you want? What it is you desire? What even is the focus of taking the cup and taking the bread? What? What is that exactly? And uh, it's like the Lord said to me, what I've been saying to you, Carrie, you know, in the Old Testament, I was content to be with my people because I knew what the end game would be. Uh, at Pentecost, it finally happened, and I got the intimacy that I was after. And on that day at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down, everyone thought I was going to enter uh, the big, big temple that had been built. But I bypassed it, you remember, and I entered into the believers themselves. You know, I've been God in a box before. That was in the Old Testament, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. God in a box, God on a box. And I've been there, done that. Uh, I was willing to do that back then, but now and forevermore, I will be known as God in a body. Your bodies. That's what I've been after. <laughs> um, some people ask me, are you going to get a tattoo? I don't know. I have nothing against tattoos. If Kim's not looking and I have enough narcotics, I might go and get one. I, 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 I don't like pain at all. Um, I kind of know what I would get, you know, <laughs> but I, I haven't been called to do it yet, and I'm okay with that. Uh, so don't give me a gift certificate to a tattoo joint because then I'll have a big decision to make. But, you know, I have a tattoo, but you just can't see it. It's an inside tattoo. It marks me. That's what a tattoo does. It marks you. The tattoo that I have is the presence of God. That's what marks me is his. I've had some people say, well, I want to get one tattoo in case I die. People know it's me. <laughs> you know, if I get, you know, die in a 
uh, a stampede at a rock concert or whatever. You know, they're trying to identify people. Uh, I want to have this uh, little butterfly behind my ear, you know, whatever. My daughter called me one time from Virginia Beach. She was just barely uh, a teenager. She'd go on with a friend, and she loves a rat on my cage, you know. And she called and she said, Dad, I just want you to know before I get home, I'm getting a tattoo. I said, well, honey, get a pretty one. <laughs> that was it. No fight at all. She's just like me, scared to death of pain. She came home with one of those ones that washes away in a week. She got a little butterfly. It was a pretty one. But she was messing with me, you know, trying to rebel and all that. I'm like, fine with me, get a pretty one. Um, tattoo and my daughter were to call me today um, and say, Dad, I'm going to get a tattoo. Which one would you most desire that I get? I said, I most desire you get the invisible one. And I'm saying, not saying she doesn't have it because she's walking in the light. But I want you to have that one that marks you as his, his presence. That's the undeniable tattoo. So I'm asking the Lord, you know, what about the communion elements? And in John 17, I've already told you, that's the high priestly prayer of the Son to the Father. It's a prayer from beginning to end. It's my favorite chapter of the Bible. And when you get to the very end, as I'm praying, asking the Lord to help me, He led me here to give me, in seven words, <laughs> what communion meant to Him, what it was all about. Here are the last seven words of John 17 in the New International Version. Jesus speaking to the Father. Telling the Father what He wants. That I, myself, may be in them. Hang with me for just another minute. All of us have been in this room since we walked in. And the communion elements have been with us. A counter here, a counter there, a counter there, a counter there. But in a few moments, we're going to go no New Testament on those elements. They're going to go from with us to within us. And that's what Jesus said in his prayer. That I myself may be in them. Not with them, within them. That's intimacy, my friends. Uh, the biblical word for that is holiness. <laughs> when a holy God takes up residency and presidency within low-class housing like us, I don't understand why he would prefer to dwell in us rather than that ornate temple that Herod built <laughs> for the Jews. But I think I have a hint of why. He wants us more than we want him. He is the pursuer in this relationship. <sighs> Lord, we're going to take the elements here in just a moment at the Union Point Church in New Bern, North Carolina. We've been all week on this trajectory. I'm still not done, but I have to be done. I have to finish. I mean, the bookends of what you want, Jesus, begin in John 14 and in John 17. In John 14, you talked about that you will go to prepare a place for us. And if you prepare a place for us, you would come back for us that we also may be where you are. I mean, there's something about our presence that you're crazy about. And we don't understand it, but we are so indebted because you desire us more than anything intimacy with us and then you book in that with that I myself may be in them so Lord would you help our desire to match your desire 
that we would want what you want more than we want anything. And that is an intimacy that the world cannot deny. When we go out and we encounter those who are lost and broken, that there would be someone, not something, someone about us, (laughs) other than us, that draws them in. C.S. Lewis said, For those who think holiness is dull, once you meet holiness for what it really is, it is simply irresistible. Lord, make our lives irresistible to others because you have become the essence of our lives. And that can't happen until we desire to not just know about you, but to know you. And today, uh, these elements will serve as our altar. And I think I've given the people enough to pray on. It's a simple prayer. Lord, I want what you want. I don't want to just know about you. I want to know you. I want you to know me. And when others encounter me in some way, I want them to encounter you. And then my life will not be about my performance. It'll be about your presence. So draw me into your heart as close as you desire. Make me one with you. And then let me go out into a world and share the inheritance with them begin with my family and then with those I work with or go to school with my neighbor but Lord it's okay if you just put me in contact with complete strangers and something about your life being lived through mine will bring them into eternal life now and later